Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, so Husserl, uh, what are we? We're in part one, still essence and cognition of essence, and the second chapter, naturalistic misconceptions. Um, and the, the basic idea with this chapter is it's just a sustained criticism of or critique of empiricism. Um, we'll talk about idealism a little bit as well, but essentially the whole chapter is just why empiricism is not, not the way to go. And that's our first section then, empiricism and idealism. All right, so empiricism, um, so Husserl says empiricism is popular because of the success of the empirical sciences. True as it was for, as true as it was for Husserl, that's still the case now, I think. Um, you know, the age in which we live is, is very much dominated by, the intellectual scene is very much dominated by science um, and that, that, empirical worldview, materialist worldview, that's really at the, uh, it's just, it's just everywhere, isn't it? I mean, um, so yeah, true for Husserl, it's true for us, it's still true now. And um, the way I've kind of approached this, I've, I've broken up this, this section on empiricism into two, talking about what, what Husserl talks about uh, what some of the, the features that Husserl identifies concerning empiricism, and then we'll look at some of the his criticisms. So some of the features first, he notes that empiricism denies ideas, essence, and essential being. Denies these kinds of things. It denies that they have any, denies that they exist at all, denies that they have any truth. The world is just the world of of the senses. It's what we um, interact with in our everyday experience. And that means it's anti-Platonic realism as well. So none of these kind of ideas, like ideas with a capital I or essences, none of these, none of these words really refer to anything substantial. That none of them have any kind of grounding in anything real. What's real is the empirical, the, the world of the senses, the world of our experience. Uh, and so it takes everything, all knowledge or judgments to be grounded in experience. That's kind of the, the um, I, I guess, a, a definition of, of uh, empiricism. But what it means then is if, if you take all knowledge to be grounded in experience, that it means the genuine science and the science of experience are one and the same thing. There is no other. I mean, science is the science of experience. Science, any science is studying um, the, the physical world, the material world, the natural world. And that's, that's because we're starting with this, this idea that all knowledge is grounded in experience. The ex what our what our everyday experience is in this natural environment that is the real, and therefore any science, as in something that studies what is, uh, is is ultimately or, or must be concerned with that world, the world of of, of experience. Um, so yeah, so genuine science, science of experience, they're one and the same thing. There is no other kind of science. Um, he says that empiricism is guided by facts and by facts, he means, um, real world facts, the, the, the facts of our, of the natural world that we live in, that we, that we experience. And he gives us a, a general thesis of empiricism, which is that all valid thought has its ground in experience as the sole object giving intuition. So all objects are empirical objects and all reality is empirical reality. And that, that phrase, object giving intuition, that's kind of an important one for 
Purcell and for phenomenology. So it's worth just keeping that in mind. We talked about it in the last video as well, I think, prim primordial dator uh, of something, of experience it might have been. Uh, but primordial, that, that, and dator means uh, object giving. So that, that's a really important concept, uh, which we're going to talk about a lot over the course of the next few videos, over the course of the series, actually. But the, the general thesis of empiricism, all valid thought, has its ground in experience, and that's the sole object giving intuition. All of our objects that we, that we study, all of the objects that we can study, come from the empirical realm. The world, the, the natural world, the world of our experience. Cool. So what are some of Husserl's criticisms here? He, uh, he says that empiricism leads to skepticism and absurdities. And that's because direct experience concerns only singular elements and no generalities. No essences. Essences don't really mean anything. In this in this realm because the world of or the natural world the world of, of um, empiricism concerns only with, only what we deal with only what we know and what we what we know what we experience are always individuals they're always individual things that we experience we don't experience any general any uh, universals or any general terms any essences we don't experience the essences of anything um, so if you confine yourself to this to studying this realm um, you're going to let you, you're leading yourself to skepticism because you don't know if if uh, you can't you can't prove any of this there's nothing kind of there's no logical grounding on which to prove anything and it leads to absurdities because individual objects will always, I mean, you can't draw any universal conclusions um, if, if all you're studying are empirical individuals, singular elements. So empiricism relies on induction. That's its only, that, that's its primary tool. We look at the world, we look at these individual um, objects that we experience and then we attempt to form rules or, or maxims um, based on these individual things that we based on you know the the frequency of the individual things that we see um, so if, if it's, it's that old thing right if every swan you see is white then you, you'll, you'll draw the conclusion that all swans are white until you happen to come across a black swan. And then, then you've got to kind of re refigure your, your theories. Um, so that, that's kind of a weakness Husserl sees. Everything, it, it's, its method of progress relies on induction. And that, again, that's just because we're focusing on the, the empirical world, the world of concrete individuals rather than um, this, this kind of the, a deeper understanding of essences, what makes individual things the individual things that they are. Um, another criticism he makes is that the general thesis is a biased starting point. So that general thesis, all valid thought has its ground in experience as the sole object giving intuition. It's biased because we're presupposing a truth before we, we even start investigating. We're presupposing that all valid thought has its ground in experience. That the only valid, uh, that the only object giving intuitions are experiential ones, are from the world of our everyday natural experience. The other criticism is that even natural science scientists rely on essential insights when they're grounding their theories. So things like, you know, that they use um, essential universal truths of math, of logic. We talked about some of these uh, in the last video as well. 
but they use these when they're grounding their theories, um, kind of even as they deny that that these things have any kind of um, valid truth at all. Deny that the truth of essence is, but using these essential universal truths in order to ground their theories. Um, and and if you point that out, Husserl says they they claim that these insights, these essential insights, they aren't they aren't anything um, they aren't anything in and of themselves. All they are are insights formed from habit through experience over countless years of evolution. So again, the the focus, the the the, the central idea of empiricism, it's all about our experience, our uh, um, experience in the natural world with these natural objects, and and that's it. There, there's nothing else going on. So what even that the the when they rely on these essential truths, these essential insights, they they claim that these essential insights are, are just the result of uh, our experience, the result of experience in the natural world over countless years of evolution. And, and so, again, denying any kind of truth value to essences, to universals, to any kind of, to anything that isn't, that doesn't come back to the natural world, the world of, of our experience. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my summary of, of what Husserl has to say about empiricism. If we just turn to idealism quickly, he doesn't say a lot about idealism, but he does make a couple of comments. Um, so first, idealism denies the empirical claim about experience. So it accepts pure thought, which is, which is a better position, right, for Husserl. That's, that's kind of an important tenet for Husserl, so that's, that's a plus for idealism. However, it fails to recognize a couple of things. First, pure intuition doesn't recognize pure intuition, by which Husserl means a mode of being presented in which essences are primordially given as objects. Back to that object-giving concept again. Uh, so idealism denies that, or it doesn't recognize this mode of, of presentation where essences are given as objects. They appear for us as objects. And that's kind of, that's the core of Husserl's phenomenology. This idea that, that essences can appear for us as, um, as objects. So, and in, in, in failing to recognize that, idealism has missed something which is, which is central for Husserl. And another thing that it fails to recognize, uh, and kind of in the same vein of thought, is it, rec it doesn't recognize that judgment is a kind of dator intuition. And again, dator, that object giving. Basically, the problem is that, that idealism doesn't understand that... Uh, Essences that that judgment, these things, um, the kind of the mode in which these things appear for us, is as objects. So it's missed this this crucial idea that um, everything, including concepts, essences, the universal truths, these things appear for us as these primordial dator intuitions, as these object giving. That, that's kind of, it's, that's the, the mode in which these things come to us as, the mode in which these things appear. And, and that's really, I think, I think it, it's not wrong to say that that's a crucial, a central tenet of phenomenology, 
that, that this idea of object giving, that um, everything appears to us as as an object, and that, that's why intentionality is such an important thing for Husserl, because intentional uh, that that everything everything has an object. Everything we're not we're never just this. Um, blank consciousness we're always consciousness of something we're always consciousness of an object and that's just that's just the way that thought is it's the way that consciousness operates and uh, so in missing that 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 insight um idealism misses something which is which is central for herself on the the the, uh, the other thing about idealism is that it, it tends to justify itself through a feeling of self-evidence so it can't it can't justify itself in in kind of the natural world natural experience so it, it just it has to justify itself in some way though and the way it does it is through this um, kind of ambiguous and unclear feeling of self-evidence and uh, Husserl calls this a, a mystical index very, an index of truth, mystical index of truth. So, uh, you know, not really grounding itself in anything substantial. Uh, and so that's empiricism and idealism. In the next section, we'll turn to look at essential science. Okay, so in this section, um, we'll look at we're turning to look at essential science, so Husserl's alternative, his his approach, um, as opposed to to natural science, um, so as opposed to ideal, uh, as opposed to empiricism, and to idealism. Uh, so a couple of things that he has to say, or a couple of things that a couple of comparison points, I think we can make regarding essential science and, and natural science, in particular empiricism, and that's the, that's the focus, it's the main focus of, the, of this chapter. So regarding uh, natural science, Husserl substitutes intuition for experience. So instead of, of grounding everything in experience, which as we've already mentioned is a presupposition, presupposing that the uh, that the natural world is is at the only source of, of objects for us um, instead of, of kind of relying on that starting with that that from that biased point Husserl wants to start from the word intuition uh, so and I mentioned this in the last video I'll just throw it up again intuition has nothing to do with some kind of um, airy fairy like uh, feeling or, or or a sense that something's true but you don't know exactly why it is or how you got to that conclusion um, but but you just you feel that, that it's right it's nothing to do with that um, intuition just means it's kind of hard to it to um, define actually but to intuit something means to just have, have have grasped something in some way, to have um, apprehended it, even to be conscious conscious of it, without without um, overloading that word conscious at all, just just grasping something, the act of mentally or intellectually grasping something. That's all that intuition means for Husserl. Has nothing. No kind of mystical or, or feeling-based um, undertones to it. No, it doesn't have any any that that sense at all. It's just just this the way in which we perceive, grasp. But it's, it's not just perceiving, as in in you know physical perception either, but but the way we mentally perceive something the way, we, the way we intellectually grasp something that is that is as valid as anything that we experience in in the external world in the world of in the natural world 
So kind of replacing experience with intuition. Intuition is our, is Husserl's starting point. Um, so anything that we, we grasp, we know, we, in kind of an intellectual sense of that word, um, a mental sense of that word, anything we, we grasp in that way is available for uh, analysis, is available to, to, to come into the science of phenomenology. We're not restricting ourselves to experience in the natural realm. So with that, with that substitution, Husserl thinks that he's the true positivist. Positivist meaning uh, an unbiased grounding of all science on what is positive. Uh, and he's, he's the, the true positive as, as, as opposed to the empiricist because he accepts all kinds of intuition. He accepts all kinds of um, apprehensions of things. He, he accepts any, any time we grasp something intellectually, it, whether it be um, because all things appear for us as objects, whether they are external physical objects or whether they are concepts or whether they're essences all these things appear for us as objects and Husserl takes all of these as his um, as his subject of inquiry he admits all of them into his science of understand his science of, of uh, essences and so he's getting He's, get, he's getting to the core of what um, conscious experience is about. He, he's explaining what, what it is rather than, he's explaining what it is as a whole rather than just taking one, one portion of it, our experience of the physical world as the empiricist does. He's including all of these other things. And it, that's not going to result in a... Um, anything kind of mystical or idealist or panpsychist or anything like that. But in accepting all of these different types of intuition, he's, he's going to uh, strip them down to see what, what actually makes them what they are. So even if um, we take something like um, something in imagination, for example, when we imagine something, it appears as an object for us. Not in the same way as something in the real world, in the physical world, but it still appears as something. And that, that means that there is uh, there's a, a process going on there, which if we strip away some of the incidental, superficial features, we can get to something central in how consciousness works in explaining the structures of consciousness and that's basically what phenomenology is doing looking to understand the structures that make up that uh, conscious experience how consciousness operates how it is that objects appear for us in the first place whether they are objects that we perceive as being part of of an external reality whether they're objects that we just imagine whether they're concepts, any, any, anything will then uh, come under Husserl's umbrella, this umbrella of essential science. So yeah, he's the true positivist, not the empiricist. And the other point that I wanted to make here concerning uh, natural science is Husserl contrasts immediate seeing with the sensory seeing of experience. Um, and that's because so immediate seeing instead of like seeing with your eyes vision um, by by that expression immediate seeing what what he means is again like kind of grasping or understanding um, knowing something intellectually knowing something through thought as opposed to just physical seeing. 
So that's not, that's not our only access to knowledge, the physical senses. We also have this, this mode of, <coughs> excuse me, this mode of being um, thought, which lets us apprehend things in, in a different way. And that, that also is, is, is available for our for study here. So Husserl calls this immediate seeing. And that is another primordial dator consciousness which reveals how objects are constituted. And, and that, I mean, that actually, that's a really nice little expression there. Um, immediate seeing as a primordial dator consciousness revealing how the object is constituted. And that, that's exactly what phenomenology is doing. I'm trying to understand how objects are constituted, what it is that makes objects, objects that they are. And in order to, to understand that, we're not restricting ourselves to the physical world. We're looking at all objects, whether they be um, objects of thought with, or whether they be objects from the external world, um, because they're all objects. And so any one of these objects will give us insight into how consciousness goes about constituting these objects and that's that's what um, Husserl's essential science is studying so essential science he gives us this interesting um, quote actually which he calls the principle of all principles every primordial data or intuition is a source of authority for knowledge that whatever presents itself in intuition, in primordial form, as it were in its bodily reality, is simply to be accepted as it gives itself out to be, though only within the limits in which it then presents itself. So uh, that, that's, that's exactly what Husserl's focus is here, right? bringing in this, this idea of primordial dator intuition, um, an analysis into how an object is constituted. That's, that, that, that's at the core of phenomenology. And all intuitions are accepted. All ways of, all, all objects are accepted. All, all kinds of objects, whether they're objects of thought, concepts, ideas, essences, whether they're objects um, from the, the, the physical world, all of these objects are data points for Husserl, and we can use them to uncover how it is that that um, I'm going to go back to that that expression. It's nice that that consciousness constitutes objects for us. He also raises a couple of objections to uh, essential science. The first one is, um, he says, isn't, isn't essential insight just imagination? And therefore, something that we ought not to consider in, in a genuine science, in anything really looking to uncover true knowledge. Um, and the base, basically, no, is the answer to that. Essential insight isn't just imagination. Here's the quote. Essential insight is a primordial dator act and as such analogous to sensory perception and not to imagination. So essential insight is, um, just, this is just everything we've been talking about. Essential insight is, is not um, restricted to, ima imagination is just, you know, you're just, the focus in imagination is the thing you're imagining, right? Um, or the, or no, that's not quite right. The focus is the act of imagining. What you're doing when you imagine is you are engaged in, in a process and um, th there's no essential insight going on. There's no, you're, you're not, you're not analyzing imagination itself or the object that you're imagining. You're not analyzing it in the way that, 
that Husserl talks about analyzing. You're not analyzing it as an object which consciousness has constituted for you. Um, you're just you're, you're kind of swept up in in what's in, in the in the act of imagining. Essential insight is this taking that object, whether it be an object from from an ex, from the external world or whether it be an object that you have just imagined, and stripping away all of the um, accidental ins, accidental non-essential features until you're left with something that that goes to the structure of consciousness, how consciousness performs its task of creating these objects. When you do that, it doesn't matter whether the object is um, an object of that you've just imagined or whether it's an object from one of your senses. Uh, they're all the same at that point. Uh, so so that's, that's the idea. Essential insight is more like sensory perception than imagination in the sense that uh, the concern is with the object itself or and and not just not just the object but a a kind of uh, analysis of that object which has stripped away all of these extraneous features and and revealed something that is universally true for all objects. Uh, so that's why Husserl says uh, it's closer to sensory perception, not imagination. Cool. Imagination. Oh, yeah. Imagination is one way that, that essences can be intuited if it's analyzed in the right way. It's kind of what I've, what I've just explained. Husserl's example is a flute playing centaur. And uh, so this is an arbitrary fiction. Um, but the value in this comes when we strip away the the, the, the non-essential features and, and analyze it as um, in its capacity as as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an object as, as something which consciousness has constituted for itself. And then, like I say, it doesn't matter whether the object is something I've just imagined, um, an arbitrary fiction, or whether it's it's something that I have, um, an object that, that's, that's formed from my sensory um, engagement with, with, with a, the natural world. Another objection that he mentions is this criticism that essences or ideas are, are concepts and concepts are only mental constructs so again the, and the, kind of the same the same we can take the same approach to this essences are essences are concepts constructed by the mind fine but but so is everything that's kind of the core of, of phenomenology as well everything is an object constructed by the mind, even even things that you know we we objects that we construct from our sensory impressions of the natural world, those are still objects constructed by the mind. So everything is an object constructed by the mind. It's just what it's just how consciousness operates. It's the structure of of objects. Objects are objects for consciousness, and and consciousness is always behind them, behind any object that that you can that you can intuit, whether it be um, intuiting through imagination or intuiting through um, a pure mental construct a concept or an essence or whether it be an object from the external world it's just it's just the way consciousness works um, and it's it's the nature of what it is to be an object is to be an object for consciousness constructed by consciousness 
So whether, whether the object is constructed by the mind or not, then, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. All objects are constructed by consciousness. So, um, so the, the, and that kind of deflates, deflates the objection. He, and he finally talks about number presentation here. Number, actually. He talks about number. And he says number presentation, the way that we um, grasp number when we think about it, number presentation is not the number itself. The number itself, numbers, are what they are, whether we construct them or not, whether we, whether we um, form an object of them in our minds or not, the number is, is still what it is. And the, the point is that, again, the, the fact that it's a mental construct has, is completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter that, that, um, that, that this is, 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 it doesn't even make sense to say it's just a mental construct. It is a mental construct. But it, that doesn't undermine the uh, the validity or the truth of 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 the num of numbers or of whatever it is that that we are constructing. Okay, I think I'm, I'm I think I'm belaboring that point <laughs> as I, as I tend to do. But uh, so let, let's leave that there. And uh, the final point I wanted to make is that. At the end of this chapter, he herself divides scientific inquiry into two broad camps. The first, the dogmatic sciences. And by dogmatic, strangely enough, it's, this is not a pejorative term. So he doesn't mean anything negative by this. He means um, sciences that are unconcerned about skepticism. And that means that we're starting from the primordial givenness of facts. We're starting from not, not we're not focusing on the fact itself, you know, whether, whether it's real or whether it's not, or how do I have access to, to, um, to, to objective truth or, or not. These are, to have kind of missed the point already. They're presupposing that there is an object of truth to know in the first place. Husserl's starting, the, or these dogmatic sciences are starting from the fact that objects are given and looking at, at what we can understand about that, looking at what that means, looking at how these objects are given, how they're formed, how they're constituted, what are the structures of consciousness that, that that underlie these things. And then it doesn't matter whether, or the question just kind of disappears. Is there an object of reality? Skeptical questions just don't make any sense anymore because we're, we're, what, we're, what we're investigating, what we're analyzing is, is real, right? The, the object itself, the, the givenness of the object, the fact that the object appears for us, that's what, phenomenology is is studying the in essence the structure of consciousness how objects appear for us the other kind of science he talks about um or scientific inquiry are philosoph is philosophical and by that he means epistemological in nature so gets kind of caught up in these skeptical problems starts wondering about the the where the knowledge itself is is our knowledge of these objects does it refer to any kind of absolute truth or or a truth independent of of um, our apprehension of these objects and that that has kind of already missed the point for herself it's already it's already First of all, it's already presupposed some things about the world, and secondly, it's 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 missed the more important underlying fact that objects have been given, objects have been constituted. Uh, so that's interesting, actually, that he he sides with 
what he calls the dogmatic sciences and um, is critical of f philosophical sciences. So, uh, or what he calls philosophical science, I guess. But yeah, so he, he is quite, quite critical of this, the philosophical tradition, which has tended to, to kind of get stuck in these problems of epistemology. How do we know that what we know is real? How, you know, do we have access to, to the truth and, and these kinds of questions without, um, which which really are, as I've said, kind of kind of meaningless questions for Husserl, and also have missed this more more fundamental, um, primordial givenness that that objects represent. All right, summary. So we started with empiricism, and the basic idea here: all valid thought has its ground in experience as the sole object-giving intuition. So we're, we're locked in this natural world, this world we experience through our senses, um, and, and, and everything comes back to that. Some of the criticisms that Husserl made about this, it leads to skepticism. It also leads to absurdities. There's the skeptical, how do we know that what we, what we, what we think we know is actually the truth, leads to absurdities because we're dealing with concrete individuals, specific individuals, rather than, than uncovering essential truths. Another criticism, it proceeds from a biased starting point. We're presuming from the beginning that there is this external world separate from us, which we are, um, uh, which we're taking a position on and which we could therefore be, be wrong about. So it starts from from this treating treating uh, the world of experience as as the the only source of objects for us, but that but that's a um, that's a presupposition. There, there's no reason for making that assumption. And f and the last criticism uh, it relies on essential insights anyway. Natural science always includes these universal references to universal essential truths um, but it kind of makes use of them while at the same time denying that that they are what what uh, they, that there is anything special about them that there is anything of value of kind of truth value in them and then we looked at idealism uh, which which was good in the in the sense that it accepted pure thought but it failed to recognize pure intuition. And that pure, pure intuition is that idea that um, everything, actually, including essences, including concepts, including judgments, they're all primordially given as objects. So it misses this idea that everything that appears for us appears for us as an object, whether it be a mental concept or you know, in essence or a um, something that that we've we've grasped through our senses something physical everything appears for us as an object and so I'm missing that it's missed this fundamental truth about how consciousness works uh, and that that's the problem that Husserl had with that and then we looked at essential science at the end and really the, the, the main thing to take away from this, I think, is that principle of all principles. Every primordial data or intuition is a source of authority for knowledge. Any intuition, any, which is to say any object-giving operation, any object-giving process is, tells us something about how consciousness works, tells us something about the structure of consciousness. Uh, and that the structure then of of all knowledge, the structure of of all reality, that's um, then that's the core of of phenomenology. All right, so hopefully that has helped a little bit. Um, 
Yeah, when I, when I when I made these notes, it, it didn't seem like there was going to be a lot to talk about. But somehow, when I start talking, it always I don't know if it just expands into something more rich with ideas, or if it devolves into like kind of rambling. Um, probably a mixture of both. But uh, but that's the second second chapter anyway. Um, thanks for listening. I hope you I hope that helped, and uh, I'll catch you in the next video.